I'm gonna go on stage and I'm gonna deliver what I want to see when I'm in the audience. Like I washed dishes at my dad's restaurant to buy my Marshall cabinet. Everybody thought the whammy pedal was stupid until they heard Tom Morello. Even if you're a session player, it's in your favor to be a songwriter. And I think that's what makes me turn Phil X on. You know what I mean? I gotta be Phil X. here from Gibson Brands, and I am sitting with none other than the man himself, Mr. Felix. What's up, man? Oh my gosh, what's Dude, up? What is enough right now? I haven't seen now? you in so long. It's been a while. It has. It's been a we while, We both had man. shorter hair. We did. We're bringing the rock back. We did. And how did, how did I get gray and you didn't? What happened? I'm older than you, too. What? I just, I won the hair lottery. We gotta talk, we gotta talk. I got a lot of stuff to go over with you. You're um, talking guitars, right? The best was, yes. Okay. The best was the intro jab. Yes. You send me that, and it's funny because I'm never really prepped for like a jam, but it was so great to hear you on the, uh, the voice recorder. You're like, one, two, show me the riff, and then at the end you're like, loop. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well maybe he wants me to put like a little turnaround on the end, and then I just found you're like, no man, just stick straight. Stick Go straight. Do it. do it. Let's just do it. It's fun. Actually, that bit is, uh, when I play with the drills, we have a song called Sunny Days, and that's okay. kind of like the riff to Sunny Days. Minus a little intricacy at the, in, in bar four. But, uh, and at the beginning, just one year, I just started doing this thing. Like they would do the groove and I would just solo until the actual song came in. Yeah. And then night after night, I would just improv. And it really, it's a great way to hone in on that craft of mm -hmm. improv. Because you're watching YouTube. Because everything's on YouTube the next day. And you're watching YouTube the next day. And I'm like literally listening to me play go, what was that lick? And I have to rewind and hear it again. Because ah, okay. it's just coming from here sure. and not here. And that's amazing. And I don't think enough people do that anymore. I'm super excited because, dude, not only is the playing like hot fire. Can't even hold it in my hands. Literally. <laughs> the visual. The stage presence, all that. We're going to talk on all that. But real quick, you know, just from hearing what just went down in, in the intro right now. Dude, let's talk about, let's take it from the beginning. Okay. Let's take it from the top. Hit me with the influences. Hit me with when you started playing and what got you into the guitar and then what immediately just like lit the fuse. There was a, a, a variety of fuses over years. Yes. So my dad played bazooki. Okay. And I grew up listening to Greek music. And I realized at a young age that music can make you laugh and music can make you cry because he knew like, a, like 500 political songs from the 40s when he grew up in Greece. So when he, when he had the bazooki out, it was like Elvis was in the building and people, he's playing something major and people are laughing and he's playing something minor and people are crying. And I'm like, man, music's a powerful thing. Even young, right? Yeah. And then by the time I was eight, because he got me playing guitar. By the time I was eight, I had an Elvis set. Like I could sing and play like Teddy Bear and Blue Suede Shoes. And we're at this Greek wedding. And my dad's like, hey, the band's taking a break. Why don't you do your Elvis songs? I'm like, what? And he, my dad was Mr. Confidence. He walked up to the band. He goes, hey, guys, while you're eating, my son's going to play a couple of songs. And they're like, what? Wait, what's going on? He's like, he needs your guitar and your microphone. <laughs> and they're like, OK, sir, we'll, just say, we'll get right on it. So I had a guitar in my hands. And I did my you know, Blue Suede Shoes and Teddy Bear. And this is way before YouTube. Mm -hmm. 
where you can Google eight-year-old playing Elvis songs at a wedding. No, there was nothing like that. So everybody in that room was this is the first time they saw anything like this in their lives, and they freaked out. And in turn, it made me go, I think this is it. I think this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, and that was it. And then it flew into my, my cousin when I was 11. My cousin introduced, introduced me to Ted Nugent. So this was before Van Halen. Like, Van Halen was the ultimate fuse. Okay. But Ted Nugent was like, oh my God. Like, I, I got Double Live Gonzo, and I came home every day and dropped the needle on Double Live Gonzo, and I learned songs like Stranglehold and Cat Scratch Fever and Wang Dang, Sweet Poon Tang, and all this stuff. It was like an incredible, and he, the, his banter on stage, it was almost comical. It was like rock and roll in, on, a, on a vinyl. So... Flash forward, Eddie Van Halen, I hear eruption like everybody else and lose my mind. Like, is that a violin? Like, nobody knew how to tap. Mm. Nobody knew anything like that. So, and his, it was his rhythm playing, too. It was like everything that he incorporated into his style as a youngster himself lit the fire, man. It was like, and then I knew right away that I didn't want to be a copycat. But what I got from him was his inventiveness. And what I got from him was, you need your own licks. Mm. And that's what I got from Eddie Van Halen. And then when I was 17, I took bazooki lessons, and that lit another fuse because it turned my pick into fire. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that, fast forward to today, because I saw a video of you doing the thing where you take the two strings. You the bazooki the tuning. Okay, yes. Yes. so we got to talk about that too a little later. Okay, okay. Yeah, sure. So that, now, it, now it's from, the dots are connecting now. Okay. Van Halen comes out. You said something interesting there. Dude, Van Halen comes out. But you, instead of like copying the licks or like learning the licks, which you did as well. Yeah, of course. But that's weird how it like told you to trigger and do something amazing or uh, something yeah. t original. Because, yeah, you're right. The dude totally like re reinvented the wheel at that well, point. Well, and then how many players try to copy that, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you, you're a copycat. It's like, you know, I, I always use this example too. Like, Everybody thought the whammy pedal was stupid until they heard Tom Morello. Sure. In, uh, you know, Rage Against the Machine. Well, they almost didn't really know what to do with it even. And then it was like, age. then everybody went out and got one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was like, and then you, when you hear it, you're like, oh, sounds like Tom Morello. <laughs> it's like when you hear totally. people, some, some people took tapping to another area. Right? right, right. Like you got the Nuno and Red Beach and, uh, you know, Jeff Watson was doing the eight finger thing and they took tapping to another place, right? Mm -hmm. But it all stemmed from the Van Halen inspiration. So mm. I stopped tapping completely because I didn't want anybody to say that's an Eddie Van Halen thing. Gotcha, because everyone was doing right. it. Right. And then also, you know, I heard, you know, like everybody learned uh, Steve Vai do that, you know, um, Eugene's trick bag in the Blue Crossroads movie. Oh. Right? I mean, it wasn't him, it was Ralph Macchio, but you know, you know, you were yeah. listening to Steve Vai do it on the track. Right. And everybody learned that. And then if you did anything like that, it's a Steve Vai thing. And that's that thing. And that's an Eric Johnson thing. And, and I, if I do something like that, if I come up with the lick and it's too close and somebody says, oh, I love that vibe vibe, I'm like, I delete it. Mm. Because I'm that guy. I don't want people to say, man. And it's funny because I put I put up something now, and people go, man, it's total dime, like you know, dime bag. Sure. I'm like, I never got into Pantera ever. Right. So maybe it's the same influence that we have, which is for sure. Yeah. Because this is like Eddie Van Halen meets uh, Ace Frehley. Yeah. Plus Presley took it somewhere else. Like he invented himself. So I mean, I wanted to be an individual. Mm. And that was most important to me. And that's why I made a crazy whammy bar, too. And people are like, that's fucking stupid. Uh, but for me, it was like, I just, I'm just i singing and playing, and I don't have time to look for the bar, so I'm going to stick it out like a kickstand. I, I wondered about that. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder about that. And I think it's cooler that you don't, because then I see what you can pull off without using it. Yeah. And then it also gives us, like, me and so many other players that watch you, where it's like, oh, yeah, I didn't even think of, like, doing something like that. Like, right. we know like that there there's something <laughs> behind the nut to, to Right, bend, behind the nut, and then doing the tuning peg drum. Never really ball. thought about it, you and know? I was at the, okay, remember when the Cat Club was there? Yeah. And somebody requested Eruption, and I'm like, I never do Eruption, but, you know, they're, really, they're being really sweet and throwing money on the stage, so I do Eruption. And I did it with the tuning peg, the, the first dive bomb, and somebody literally walked up to me, man, I, for my, my entire life, I thought that was a whammy bar. 
I'm like, <laughs> it is. <laughs> just not tonight. I just don't have yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, it's interesting because like I know you take from your favorite players. Yes. And then you you take your musical influences from your favorite bands. Yeah. And sometimes the player it happens to be part of the band, and that yes. is the big thing. So like you know when we were talking about like you know. What what were you snagging from who? Like well, I, you look know, at, look and I don't want to say ripping off, but no, like who no, are you? But it's like, not ripping off though. It's if you take a smidgen of Angus Young's vibrato, yeah, and choice of notes, mm -hmm. and you got Eddie Van Halen with his flair and almost like comedic sense, like it's got his playing has a sense of humor, yeah. And then you got Uli Roth, who was the first guy to do this speed picking thing, I think, you know, back in seventy three to seventy six. Uh, with the Scorpions, and then you have Tony Iommi with the riffs, and you have uh, Randy Rhodes, and then you have, you know, even Matthias Jabs from the Scorpions, because that tone that he's got in no one like you is monstrous. Yeah. And then you're like, ah, you take all of that, and as long as you don't sound too close to it, it becomes you. It's like your palette and arsenal. Let's call it an arsenal. Let's call it arsenal. Yeah, sure. Because it's a bunch of weapons. You go out there and kill people. Um. Do you, well, yeah, you can. Hey, I mean, strong, strong, no choices. Yeah. <laughs> so, so on that whole subject there, because dude, I, you know, you get into the the the, the normal phases where it's like the Hendrix thing, the Steve Ray Vaughan thing, or like yes. you know the Van Halen thing. Uh, do you think that there is? Because uh, I get this. This has come up before. Like I'll post. I posted some stuff on YouTube, and it's just me playing like a certain solo from a song. Yeah. And then you know there was comments where it was like. Yeah, great man, awesome job. Yeah. Or and I know those people aren't guitar players. Like they're just normal people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then the guitar players will come out and be like, "Well, that's not how we played it," or "That's not how it's." Well, a, you know, that, and that's it's like, the, well, I have this thing. I have this thing, especially with Eddie Van Halen, because there are a million covers on yeah. YouTube, right? I am more about uh, fire, breathing fire, more than being accurate. Like, I, I see somebody yeah. play it perfect, but there's no fire. Yes. And then you see somebody who doesn't play it perfect, but he's got the sense and the bounce and yeah. the fire and the joy. Yeah. I way prefer that. Because I'm, everybody knows, all my, all my friends and even fans know that I'm a huge Eddie Van Halen fan. So someone sends me a video, you gotta check out this girl. She's 14 and doing an eruption note for note. Note for note. And I'm like, yeah, but did she do a backflip or anything? Right. It's not hard anymore. You just brought it up. I did, it just totally triggered because your playing is in the vein of that when it comes to like stuff coming out. Like, you know, Van Halen plays a rhythm and then he hits like a pinch harmonic and a dive bomb and goes back to the rhythm. Yeah. And the rhythm's like right on point. But like it just broke up the monotony of the rhythm in a tasteful exactly. way. In a tasteful way. Yes. And that's what I want to hear. I want to hear that kind of thing. And, and people that are playing everything like super fast and super perfect, I get, it's monotonous and boring to me. And I mean, I can't, I mean, okay, I can't play that, but I don't want to hear it either. <laughs> yeah, do you think there's value in like learning a song note for note first and then takeaways from that? Or do you think it's kind of like, well, just zoom in on what you think you want to grab and well, pull out? I think when I was young and I was, had to do three 45 minute sets of covers every night and I was dropping the needle or putting a cassette in. Yes, um, those things. And rewinding and, and ruining the cassette because you rewound it so much. I learned Over the Mountain by Ozzy on a cassette. Oh. And, but it trained your ear. And not only that, I think when you learn a song by yourself in a room, listening to the music over and over and over, you, you, you learn more why it's so awesome and you learn more why this harmony works and why this chord progression is amazing and all that stuff you learn from that when somebody just shows it to you uh on youtube it's not the same thing because it's just it's that like if snapshot. someone says oh you want to get a guitar here's a thousand dollars go buy a guitar or you work you, you mow 1500 lawns to raise <laughs> the money to buy, like I wash dishes at my dad's restaurant yeah. to buy my Marshall cabinet. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I appreciated the hell out of that Marshall cabinet. Mm -hmm. It's not like somebody gave it to me. So I think it's the same thing with music. When you learn by ear, you appreciate it more. And when I go to a session and I bring my ear to the session and people are like, how did you know what to do so quickly? Because mm. I learned all right. this music when I was a kid. and. To answer your question more specifically, I would learn the song like the record and then stray from it later on. Okay, you so know? like, because um, like I happen to love 
live Jimmy Page, and the record Jimmy Page is fantastic, but I also yeah. love a lot of the live stuff where it's like, you know, people will say it's a little sloppy or it's, yeah. it sounds like it's about to fall apart, but it's not. Yeah. Like, I, I enjoy a lot of the live stuff. Even, I do bootleg stuff. Right. <laughs> I do bootleg stuff because it's. I even do the Whammy Boy thing in like uh, On Fire and Alien. Movie. Like he yeah, does yeah. a Whammy Boy thing and yeah. it's like, now I'm on a tune again because I'm, I'm an animal. But in it's the okay. vein of. Not an open no. Right. It's in the vein of, and it's almost well, like in the mindset. Like it's you, the you mindset. try to get in their mindset. Because you, for me, it's like, uh, that. see, I, going back to Ed, I saw 1980, 1981, 1983, 1984. I saw all those mm. tours. I was 14 until I was 17 or 18. And it changed my life, man. Yeah. It was not only yeah. him playing the most ridiculous guitar you ever heard or saw. It was him sprinting across the stage doing it and climbing PA stacks doing it and running around and sliding on his knees. And I'm like, this is insane. And you got three other superheroes flying around the stage at the same time. Yeah. It's like, it, that, that, this, it really raised the standard of what I expected. And then when I started performing, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go on stage and I'm gonna deliver what I wanna see when I'm in the audience. That's a great statement. Well, thank you. Thank you, that's great, that's great, yeah. That's and that's great. that's it. People go, why, how, how you like that on stage? I go, dude, I'm I'm a fan. That's what you want. I want to be in the front yeah. row and be entertained, and I, so I'm, I'm I'm delivering that. And and then you know when you work on licks until you're blue in the face, they really don't become a part of you until you go on stage and perform them, or at least jam in the room with them. You know, then it becomes, oh, now I get it. Now I got a, a band plan, and now I know how it feels, and that actually doesn't feel that right when I get there, so I'm going to fix that. And that's when stuff becomes you. Yeah. And there's so many closet bedroom players that don't experience that. And I hope at some point they all do. It's a whole other range of... of uh work that has to be put into it because yeah. now it's almost like double the work has to be put into where this can happen without even thinking about it right because all the obstacles right is the sound going to be great every night right you got your in-ears even if you're in in-ears your monitors are never great but in-ears i hate in-ears mm. i just, it just sounds so sterile to me and you don't get to hear the audience are you, you not know? using in-ears no we, i am with bon jovi i use in-ears and yeah. like when, when you play um wembley stadium like we did in 2019 and it sold out and it's 82,000 people you can't hear them because you got your, your, you're plugging your ears with oh, their in-ears, right? Yeah. So at the end of the night, when you pull it out to take the bow, and then you finally hear them, it's emotional because, oh my God, you sounded like that all night? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's amazing that way. And then, um, and then, you know, and then two weeks later, I'll, I'll play with the drills in, in a club like the Whiskey or something like that, and I got monitors again, and my amps, you know, shooting flames into my ass. It's like, oh, I love this so much. Because you can really feel it. Yeah. But with in-ears, you don't really feel it. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I guess it'd be like an advantage if you were for vocals, maybe, because yeah. you can really no, hear sure. over the mix. But yeah, I know what Absolutely, you mean. Yeah. Uh, just having the, the air moving behind you or just feeling it. And then you're, because then you're, you're not, you're a little disconnected from the situation. You want to hear something crazy? Mm. Overdrives. There are overdrives that work great when you're standing in front of your amp and don't work great in your in-ears. Whoa. Crazy, right? Okay. I'm like, oh shit, I need, I need a whole new game for this gig. So then I'm auditioning, we're doing, we're rehearsing, when everybody goes for lunch, I'm auditioning like 24 overdrive pedals to see what works in my ears. In the ears, interesting. That, that makes yeah. a lot of sense because yeah, you're right, we're not hearing uh, a lot of the EQ and, 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 and stuff that's happening in the room versus, wow. Yeah. So then amp settings are changing too. No. No. Because my amp is my perfect rhythm sound, and then I need an overdrive for Raise Your Hands. I need a different overdrive for a country solo like Lost Highway. I need an, a different overdrive for somewhere in between. So there's three flavors. Yeah. And they'll change, even on tour. You know, I'll try mm -hmm. something else at Soundcheck, and I go, ooh, I like that. Mark Van Gool is my tech. I'm like, can you swap that out? He's like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then I use it that night, and I go, fuck, I don't like it. Oh, right, right, right. It's kind of like that. You can't. <laughs> and then it's funny. I'll watch a YouTube video the next day, and then I go, I 
think I gotta take the tone down on that overdrive pedal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. That's awesome. I mean, it's always research, right? Sure. And we're finicky, dude. Yeah. Finicky. Like, it's so crazy how one day I love this pedal and then the next day I just don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it can happen. It, it can totally it, happen. And, and it happens and, and, all the and time. And it's just, or, it's, or it's that day and the next week you're like, this pedal's actually really good. And then you come back to something. Like you see a picture of your pedal board. I always take a picture of my pedal board and then I always scroll through photos and I go, okay, remember that show and that lead tone was amazing and oh, that's what I used. Mm. Where is that thing? <laughs> right, right. It's, it's an ongoing thing until you I die. I got a local store here that I you know, trade with and stuff. And I think there's been a few times where he's yeah. like, what are you back for? Yeah. Hey, remember that thing I gave you last week? Can we like swap back? Yeah, see? You know? That's you know? Always, man, always. Um, that's a lot and, and that's now, when you're applying this, you know, whole thing, dude, you do a lot of session work. You've done a lot of session work. You play yeah. in a ton of bands, bro. What's the deal with the session playing, with the hired gun thing? Like, are you coming as Phil X most of the time, or are you coming in already kind of figuring out what they need? No, um, it's a blank slate. Okay. 100%. You walk in, and I mean, if... if if someone, if I'm, if I've recorded all the guitars and the acoustics and the stereo pair, and then there's a, a wall of guitars, and then they say, "Give us a solo," even then I know it's only fifty percent Phil X. Okay, what's the other fifty? Fifty is what you're feeling, you know. Like mm -hmm. I mean, I know the vocal is king, and everything needs to support the vocal. So okay. when I went in, and my biggest calling card, like, I mean, I worked with Rob Zombie, and I played on Alice Cooper's record, Brutal Planet, back in 2000. Yep. I did some Avril Lavigne and Kelly Clarkson, but when I did the Daughtry record in 2006, they gave us demos that were like an acoustic guitar in Chris's voice. And Chris is an amazing singer. Yeah. He's the, the real deal. Yeah. So it was me and Josh Fries and a, a bass player, Paul Bushnell, and we... At, at some point, you're like, wow, we really got to start doing some different things. We don't want the whole record to sound the same. Yeah. So we started really exploring, and then we would take a day on a, a one song for guitars. Wow. And we would just, you know, it was one of those things where, and then when we finished that record, I was just putting so much of me into it that I was getting calls like, hey, you worked on the Daughtry record. We need you for a session on Friday. Nice. Call Phil X. Call the guy who did the Daughtry record. Phil X, is that a real name? You know, that kind of thing was going on. So it was an amazing calling card. And it's, one producer was so specific. They were like, okay, get Phil X and tell him to bring the acoustic that he used on home. Whoa, like that specific. Yeah. Okay, okay. That means your instinct is right. Yeah. Well, and, that's and how do we thing get now. the instinct? How do we get that to, to well, you know, how do we carve I mean, that out? A song, even if you're a session player, it's in your favor to be a songwriter. Sure. Because then you go in thinking like a songwriter. Yeah. And then, you know, everybody can do eighth notes for the whole chorus and then put pixie dust on top. But if there isn't a vocal happening, and say there's a break in the vocal in the lyric and it needs energy going to the next chord, I'll put a little riff in there. And then, and you know what we started doing when I was working with Mike Plotnikoff and Howard Benson? People record the drums, and then the bass, and then guitars. With me, the drums, and then guitars, and then bass, because Phil's going to do something that we want the bass player to do. Oh, right. So that started happening. So I mean, and then it, it, it always goes from, hey, this is what we need, go. And then it says, oh, it's you. Okay, do your thing, I'll be back in five hours. And, then, oh. and that's like, and even now, we were talking about, I do a lot of work with Chris Lord Algae, and he'll send me three songs, and I go, what are we going for? He goes, your instincts. Mm -hmm. All right. And then with Chris, I'm 99% on, on the mark. And that 1% is, can you go a little crazier in the solo? There you go. Because I'll originally listen to it and not let it, out, the, not let it all out. I'll, you know, I should do something that's a little more melodic or tonal that works with, you know, hey, this is a piece that you hear in the verse. Because you're, you're thinking about the song. Right. Yeah. And he's like, no, I need crazy. And I'm like, oh, I can do crazy. And then I send him crazy <laughs> and he goes, mission accomplished. Yeah. So it's, it's that kind of thing. And I think it's all about when you think as a writer going in, and I've talked to Tim Pierce about this too. He's the same guy. He goes in and he goes, you know, it's my job to come up with parts that make this the best song it could be, mm. that could take the chorus to the next level. And we both agreed on that. And then for the longest time in L.A., before everything kind of tanked, we were the top two guys. 
Wow. And it was like, if if I wasn't available, they'd get him. And if he wasn't available, they'd get me. And Tim is amazing. He called me one time. He goes, what are you doing on Saturday? I'm like, I don't have anything. He goes, I got a session for you. He goes, oh, you can't do it? He goes, no, I'm doing it too. But I convinced them to get a second guitar player. And I want it to be you. Nice. Because I want... I was both of you on the same thing. Yeah. Wow. So, and that happened a couple of times where we worked on the same thing. And he goes, he looks at me and goes, hey, I go high, you go low. I'm like, sure. Next song. Hey, bud, you go high, I go low this time. I'm like, all right. They're great. great. And it's like, because they want a lot... Of, when you get live off the floor, and it was funny, when I was with Tim, we would like click like this amazing... Like, I wish it was all on camera. Because mm. it'd be like, uh, you know, we're drop D. And we all, we all hit the last D, and there's no oscillation. We're both in Ooh, tune. We all nice. hit it the same, and we don't have to get that last chord again. Yeah. And even the producer's like, what? Did that just happen? Yeah. <laughs> because it's, you know what it's like to double yourself. It, yeah. But me and him were so, uh, that it was like almost perfect. And then um, I was playing my Yamaha uh, signature at one point, and I was, uh, I was lowering the pickup. Okay. And he goes, hey, what you doing? I'm going, I'm adjusting the pickup height. Oh, you're raising it? I go, no, I'm lowering it. But I'll never forget that moment. Because how many guitar players have that kind of conversation sure. at a gig? Right, right. Right? <laughs> like someone's paying by the hour. Yeah. And we're having these conversations. It was so cool. It was so cool. Oh, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, he, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. So, man, you guys were teaming up. That, that's definitely doing some damage there. That's yeah, awesome. For sure. It was wicked. Now, when it comes to your own stuff, yeah. what's the approach there? Are you like writing the riff out first? throwing it to the drummer, jamming on it? Is it all done at home in the box? And then you kind of just have like a, like a sketched out idea? Like what's, what's going on? Um, before I had a box, it was sketched out ideas and then okay. we'd get together in a room. And then, but I really knew what I wanted it to sound like, you know? And then it's a three piece band and I would ap- approach it like a composer. Like if the vocal's not doing something and the guitar needs to just do, st- be still, the bass is doing something. Okay. I got so, you. so you're always, thinking about the full picture. The, all the, the full time. picture. Yeah. And then <clears throat> Daniel Spree, he's, he's the bass player in the drills, and he's always like, like I'll throw down a bass because I got great ideas. I mean, I'm calling myself great ideas, but <laughs> I have an idea that I, I think is the vibe. It's yep. not perfect. Yep. I want it to be you. Yeah. So I send it to him, and I'm like, he, and he's the one that goes, dude, I'm totally ripping the bass you recorded. I think it's perfect. But his feel, we've played with so many drummers Dan is the glue between me and any drummer. Because mm-hmm. I'll, I'll push it a little bit, and the drummer's job is to lay it back a bit. Totally. And he's, he's filling that gap. Yeah. So it's, uh, and people come on, you guys are so tight. Yeah. Uh, it's because it's Dan. Dan's the man. Yeah. No, you guys sound great. I've seen you guys live a few times, uh, dude, in the small little Viper room. Yeah. Uh, go, back in the day, uh, we had some shows that me and you shared. Yeah. It's a little difficult going on uh, before and after you, I have to say. It's a, it's a little tough. Yeah, we... we uh, I, I, I definitely told the promoter like to never let that happen again. <laughs> I was like, I, I think I saw you at a sound check and uh, you had, a, you had a, a Marshall amp and there was a barbecue grill on yeah, the back my, of the amp. 76 man. JMP. And I'm like, this guy's got a barbecue grill. I think it's a barbecue grill. And then you go up there and like, I think you jumped out of stage. Like you came from the side, you just like came out and you had the crazy hair. And like, I'm like, this is gonna be a problem. And then the amp started cutting out and like literally you came up and did like the Fonzie and the thing just like went back on and you just started playing like nothing happened. And I'm like, dude, we are so screwed right now. Who booked this show, dude? But you guys, I mean, dude, the LA scene, everyone knew who you guys were. This was a powder with the drills. Yeah. And, uh, well, the, the powder thing was way more. Like, I mean, it was because of the, the uh, I mean, because Ninette, my ex, yeah. my first wife, she was the singer, and she put this whole Cirque du Soleil thing together before Pink. Yes, it yes. It was before Pink. That's right. And uh, she was doing all that stuff, and then, be, and I was thinking, we were bombing. We'd be on stage, and we're, I'm thinking we're bombing, but... It's the, they're, they're not making any noise because they're stunned. That's right. That's what it was. That's right. And because of the show was so elaborate and so crazy. And, uh, and the songs were really catchy too. Yes. But I just remember doing, remember the gig on Melrose? The, remember, the spot, yep. We, we played, um, I remember the first time we played there it was like 12 friends. 
And then the second time we played there, it was 24 friends and then some people I didn't know. And then the third time we played there, because we made it into uh, some kind of review paper or something, there was a lineup down the street and I didn't know anybody. But I thought, oh shit, they're here to see the other band. So I'd be like, hey, who are you here to see tonight? Oh, we came to see Powder. We heard amazing things. I'd walk 10 feet down. Hey, who'd you guys come here to see? This band Powder? Have you heard of them? Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh my God. Everybody. And that's what you want to happen totally. when you have a starter band like that. Yeah. So, I, dude, I remember, you're exactly right. People were just stunned. It was, it was a thing. It was a great show, good tunes. Uh, yeah, you guys were crushing. I mean, that, and that's how I first knew about you from, from, from having to somehow follow up that show. <laughs> Uh, when the dude came out with the juggling chainsaws or something like that, I was like, yeah, we're done. Yeah. I go, we're done. What, oh, why yeah. did you we... even book other bands tonight? Right, exactly. I think, so, what were you saying? So, I think there was someone that was like, because uh, it was weird when they used to book in, in the, uh, for yeah, those of you that don't know, the Hollywood Shuffle. There'd be five openers, or four openers yeah. and one closer. Yes. And the headliner in the middle. Sometimes the closer would get the impression that they were the headliner. Yes. But it's really, they got sold the worst spot. The worst spot. <laughs> and even the promoter told me, because I said, hey, can my buddy close for us? He goes, he really doesn't want to do that. No, no. Because you guys do the finale and the place clears out. Yeah. And I'm like, really? Yeah. He goes, yes. Because that poor band is that night playing with yeah. you guys going, we're headlining, bro. And, and you know. I'm like, good luck with yeah. that. <laughs> So that's great. I mean, and, and the moral of this story is like, dude, you've been putting in the work this whole time, man. And it's great. Oh, yeah. The vibe always stays up. The energy always stays up. That's one of the most challenging things. We're getting on to the showmanship part and talking about that like yeah. you touched on earlier. But man, it's like, I, I think I look at you and so many guitar players, look at you, we look at you because it's like, if I'm having a bad day, I'm looking at Phil X and he's still rocking and he's laughing, he's having a good time and he's keeping the vibe up and the energy up because this stuff gets hard sometimes. It, do, it does get hard. It does you know? in life and even for me. But you know what? When I put a guitar in my hands and the camera on or something and it picks me up. Yeah. You know? And I feel like I can't wait to get on stage again. And I feel like when I'm watching, like I, I scroll through Instagram like anybody else. Sure. And I see people that are amazing musicians. Yeah. But the one thing going through my head is like, yeah, you're amazing in your room, in a controlled environment, sitting on your bed in your track mm -hmm. pants with the crotch shot, and you're playing like a maniac. And but what what would you do on stage? Yeah. Can you can you do that? Yeah. Because that's when no matter how long you've been working on these things, all the elements are against you. Yes. There's a light in your eye. There's distractions in the audience. There's a heckler back there. And then there's fog and, and this thing. And, you know, a, the drummer's stick breaks and half that stick flies into your spine. And shit like that happens, man. Totally. And you need to be 100%. Yeah. Every, I think the, 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 the biggest thing that tripped me out was, like, not having good sound. Yeah. That tripped me out. Like, yeah. as soon as I walked away from my amp, it's like, I can't hear it anymore. Exactly. And then what else is happening? It's like slow motion, like the drummer's like this, and you're like, don't know where we are. Or like you said, or the gear doesn't work, something breaks yeah. down, and it's like, you know, this didn't happen in rehearsal, now what? You know what, this is funny, because I still have a problem with subs in a room. And I, I, was, I was getting into a fight with a sound guy, whether it's the drills, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll be on stage somewhere. We were in London, and I was like, uh, I go, man, Zeppelin didn't have subs, which is a three-piece band. Yeah. We don't need the bass to be that crazy. Can you uh -oh. please turn the subs uh -oh. off? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't turn them off because if I turn them off, I can't do an English accent, otherwise I would. I can't turn them off because if I turn them off, then it won't be nothing. I go, well, can you just turn them down? I'll, I'll see what I can do. And then I'm like, and then they turn it up when you're playing. It throws my pitch off. Oh. I can't sing low. Of low. And then, check this out. I'm on stage with Bon Jovi, right? and the stage is vibrating. I go, Obi, where's Obi? Obi, come here. I go, dude, he's got to turn the subs down. The stage is vibrating. Mm. And then he got this, the sound, I mean, we're playing an arena, you know, 15 to 20,000 people that night, and they're listening to me about the subs, right? right? He turns them down, and then John goes, hey, it's easier to sing now. And Everett, our percussion guy's like, whoa, what happened? I hear everything. I go, it's the subs, guys. And then two sound checks later, John looks at me and goes, hey, Phil, how are the subs? <laughs> That's great. That's well, I mean, great. everybody knows something, right? Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. That's awesome. We were talking about um, how, uh, you know, inspiration strikes, and we're talking mm -hmm. about influences. 
And there's just a couple of things that I want to elaborate on. Cool. Okay, so can we do a little bit of snippets of people's stuff? Or we can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. especially if it's just like a couple of seconds. Yeah, totally. So if when you listen to uh, Walk This Way by Aerosmith, right? Okay. And the second solo is kind of like that. <laughs> Like, what the hell is that, right? Totally. Like, Delta, triplet thing I just saw there. it, and I didn't really comprehend it. So yeah. I, I learned that, and then I thought, that is so cool. How, okay, well, how can I do that? But it was simple. So we have a song called The Drills. We have a song called uh, Saddest Girl in the World. So it's kind of like, uh, it's in G. But it's like... So I took and C and did it in G. Right? Cool. Now, but that's too similar. Somebody will figure it out. I don't oh, care. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. So then I'm like, well, how can I? And then I'm like, uh, let's see if I go. Like that kind of shit, right? Yeah. And then I'm like, okay, so wait. And then I'm doing. See, I'm in the E and I go. So I got this. I'm thinking anybody. If somebody was working on something like that, maybe they'd go. But, and I'm like, that's not weird enough for me. I gotta. Go. Right? Oh, that's dirty. Yeah. And then the other walk this way thing comes when I go. That kind of thing. So that's taking that and kind of making it my own. That's crazy, because that's not an obvious thing, really. Right. It's not like you did the riff and right. like went, you know, you didn't do like, you know, whatever the riff is and just went. <laughs> like, it's not like you did something <laughs> like where it was just kind of like a rip, you right. know, right? right. Like just right. enough to get on a commercial and yeah. not get sued, right? So yeah, yeah. the funny thing about all this is uh, it's always, everything comes from somewhere. Yeah. You know, even when I listen to... Eddie Van Halen, and I hear, okay, he got this from this guy. He got mm. this from Richie Blackmore. He got mm. this from Uli Roth. And he just talked about Clapton, right? Like, oh, Clapton, because it was the least obvious, yeah. right? And uh, and sometimes you don't want to give up all your tricks, right? And I understand that. Yeah. You know, because he whatever he took, he made it him. Sure. And there's no denying that. Right. Um, even this. This is, you know, if, if Ed's going like... Right? I'm like, okay, how can I take something like that? And it's in the song Sunny Days by the Drills. It's like, uh, I go. That kind of thing. Yeah. And it's it came from the tapping thing, but then I added a, a minor third up and made it everything pivot around those two notes. So you're just playing that, uh, instead so, of tapping, you're just using the... You're, you, you're, so yeah, if I was going... Right? right? But I'm adding. And then yeah. there's also like another tapping thing. And this happened later in my life. I, I feel like you never stop wanting to teach yourself stuff. Mm. So at one point I was bored. I reached a plateau and I'm watching a movie and I pick up my guitar and I go, what would happen if I picked the tapping part in eruption? So I came up with something like that. Now see this? My fingers say, screw you. <laughs> I can do this. But when I had to do, I couldn't do it. So I was like watching the movie going, for two hours. And then I had it. But then you can't go on stage and do that and call it yours, mm. right? So I came up with a piece that's more like. So it's love it. So is that I, the James Bond chord at the end? Yeah, what is it's, that? Okay. It's the best. Yeah. I love it. But um, it's uh, the cool thing about that is that I can do that in, the, in my own solo in the Drills show. Mm -hmm. and, and there is, I do quote eruption in this one pair, in this one phrase down here. But it, for me, it's like, uh, you're, I'm always going to quote my, my heroes. Like, I'll quote Jimmy Page. Yeah. I'll quote 
Tony Iommi, I'll quote Angus, I'll quote so many people. Because I sometimes I'll record something and I'll be like, yeah. It kind of has an Angusing thing to it, mm -hmm. right? It ends on that vibrato and it's fierce and it's like a punch in the face and I love that vibe. So I'm gonna, it's gonna be there. Yeah. Know? That's great. And you know what, dude, with, when, without even tapping it, it doesn't look like, it, because it also doesn't visually look the same, and then right. with all the other things that you added to it, yeah. it took it to another place. Yeah. Thanks, man. And it, so it's got the uh, homage there. <laughs> the homage but, but is not, apparent. But not in like this, you know, what yeah. I did with the Walk This Way thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is, too, is like I always take, I've always, uh, I love chromaticism. So people talk to me about pentatonic, and I do this thing with pentatonics where it's like, okay, well, everybody's so pentatonic, like, anti-pentatonic. I'm like, what? Mm. But have you done everything you can do? Like when people go, hey man, why don't you play seven string guitar? And I'm like, cause I haven't done everything with six. There you go. Right? There you go. So when they're like, well, wh what, you, what are you doing? You're just doing glorified pentatonic? I'm like, you can call it glorified if you want. Mm. But if this is, without adding a flat five. Okay. This is just the pentatonic lick. <laughs> You're just changing the order a little bit mm. and spreading it out. Yeah. Then when you get in a flat five going, um, it's like you just it's yeah. all depends on with a flat five. It's it's the same thing as but you're just doing the whole neck. So is that what happens when you're just in like the first box? Like what happens when you're just in the standard? You know, uh, just doing the. Is there anything that we can kind of like, you know, like manipulate there without like, in, until we get to being able to go up and down the fretboard like that? Well, I mean, there's always something like, for instance, okay, so say we're doing this, right? So like, there's always like a... You know, yeah. there's that, there's like a... There's that, there's like changing the orders, it's like sequence thing, right? Yeah. And then when you start moving around, it's uh, you're like, uh, it's the same, exact same notes, you're just playing three notes per string instead of alternating between two and three. Or, and you can add stuff like, tasty. There's all that stuff. Yeah. And then, to me, this is still pentatonic when I'm going like a, Because you basically, I, I mean, I, I did a video on this the other day. It's 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 kind of ugly when it's slow. Because mm. it's like I mean, now the cool thing about thing, this is just the pattern and taking that pattern and moving moving it down two strings. Right. Okay. And that to me, it's actually if I try stuff visually first, yeah. and if it sounds good, awesome. If it doesn't sound good, you move on. Sure. But that sounds good to me and because it's got a flat five in it and it's got both thirds. I love both thirds. Like these. Right? I love I love like, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, and it's like, uh, the other thing is too is um, pentatonic. I've done this a lot, but it's like, you got your boxes, right? So you take all these boxes down the two strings and you get. Whoa. See? Whoa. That's never happened before. And then you take all the pen and Did we get that on tape? <laughs> <laughs> and it's still in, baby! So tell us where you got the string pull trick from. No, just. Yeah, right? <laughs> Goes, hey, Dude, that's great. That's because it, it's like when it's shown like that, like when you hear it like that, it doesn't sound like the same old. Right. And that's what I'm trying, you know, people like, you can say whatever you want. I know what I like, and not everybody likes the same flavor ice cream. Mm -hmm. So we all have different, we like different tones, we like different uh, flavors of overdrive. Some people like the lush river and delay. We're playing dry today. Yeah. Right? Cause I don't. I can't believe you told me to turn the reverb off. I, I, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. He's like, man, I, yeah. I don't like I him like, anymore. You sure. But it's like, and then, see, this is also. I showed you all those little boxes, but in, if you want to change it around, I started. I turned it into a five-note phrase. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, like, say, for instance. So that, yeah, and it's great. all. But you're changing. 
sometimes the five new phrase, you don't have to be in it a different time. It's like. <laughs> I did it again, man. Okay, what? So now that you're here and yeah. I can see it, what's the what's the thing with the with the hand behind the? What, what's going on there? Oh, what's going okay. On so with that? Uh, I don't want you to give the secrets no, no, away. No, no, no. So I just I need that. like one. This is uh, when I stopped using a whammy bar because okay, I in the '90s when I was playing out and it wasn't cool to have a whammy bar. No, it was Unless not. you were Steve I, who kept doing his thing. Yeah. All the power to him. Amazing. Anybody else with a whammy bar was shunned upon. You or know, or like, a chorus pedal at yeah, this point. I, I, exactly. Right. So for me, it was like tricks like behind the dives like that or the tuning peg. And this was something that, and I'd pull it up on the whammy bar, right? Oh, right. Okay. So this is what I'm doing. <laughs> So I'm just pulling both okay. strings up. Yeah. You're not pulling, you weren't pulling the string that you were bending. It's both though. Dude, Depending that's on how fantastic. you want to go, right? Yeah. You could actually control it. Ooh. And make a chord too. Ooh, that was nice. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, wow. that was okay. nice. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Did you, yeah, that's fantastic. But okay, cool. It's that kind cool. of stuff. So I mean, I always get little things that I like and if I if it, it, it could be ripping myself off it could be doing what what did I used to do with the whammy bar that was really cool that I can't do anymore and then I came up with that that's great and it looks cool on stage oh thanks man I, I mean that's the one thing where we're always like what just happened right now what did he do <laughs> yeah and before we had phones to even video I mean I know I right be like did you see the thing you did don't know what happened. Yeah. yeah. Okay. La last one for you. And uh, okay, I don't want to give the secrets away, but like the 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 double string thing. Oh yeah, the bazooka tuning. Please, please. I've that, never done I it. I saw that the other day. I've never done it on an Explorer, so we'll see if it works. So this, the strings are tuned to the same pitch, but in the same nut notch, so they get that metal, metallic rub, right? Oh, okay, like a 12 string kind of yeah. thing. And, and because when you shake it, it's like, uh, when you shake it, it, the strings are different gauges, so they mm. shake different. So it's like a, <laughs> right? It sounds fiery. <laughs> I used to do melodies like. That kind of thing, right? Yeah. Or like. <laughs> there was a Ooh. powder tune that had the bazooka tune. It was. the solo dude it's, it's great it's and it's, this is the funny thing too the cool thing about it is like you could play something really pretty on it and when you're when i was sessioning a lot like in mid 2000s like between 2005 and 2012 and before budgets hit the <laughs> the dirt sure um i played on a a a song on daughtry's second record and a kelly clarkson song and i put a counter melody with the bazooka tuning and I totally, when you're in the mode, you're like, oh, the bazooka would be perfect for this. Yeah. But then, when you're at the gym, and you hear the Daughtry song and the Kelly Clarkson song playing back to back when you're on the elliptical machine, you're like, oh, I gotta stop doing the bazooka too Oh, no. <laughs> oh, right, right, okay. Because now, I'm, am I doing it too much? Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah it's that kind of thing. Dude, that's wild, because like that sometimes happens by mistake. I know. Right? Yeah, and you're totally. like, the fact that you actually took that and like did something with that, that's great. As far as the gear, you're pretty straightforward. You're like guitar, maybe a few pedals, and like straight into the amp, right, dude? Like it's not well, like Well, you know, I, I do what the gig calls for, right? So okay, yeah, if sure. I'm with the drills, it's two overdrive pedals. One for a little more and one for a lot more. 
but it's never too much. It's never like, oh, I'm feeding back because there's so much gain. Mm. I found there was a there was a time that we were opening up for Steel Panther, and I had this really cool gig, uh, this Gibson Atlas head, with this overdrive pedal. It sounded amazing. Yeah. But I had just done a powder gig, and I was going through a battery phase. Ever go through a battery phase? Yes. Like, Screw adapters. I'm just using batteries. Yes. Well, my tech didn't unplug the overdrive. Oh, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I plugged in where, you know, and you don't even get, you get 15 minutes to change over. Yeah. Now you it's can't, a fuzz you pedal. Can't, you can't run to the store. So I'm like, I got a tuner. I got an overdrive. I got one battery. Oh. And I, I, I decided on the tuner. Yeah. Because I go crazy sometimes, and I got to tune between song, s songs when I'm talking to the audience. Now, the funny thing is I had time to mentally prepare. I've just looked at my hand, guys, it's up to you tonight. <laughs> right? That sounds like a really bad guitar game. That we like we should totally do that on the show or something. Yeah. What three pedals, one battery. <laughs> yeah. So I it's like it's up to you, man. This, this is all you tonight. And and then um and but the funny thing is if I was started the show and stepped on my tuner and it my my overdrive and it didn't work, it would have freaked me out and it would have sucked. Yeah. But, but I had a, a moment to mentally prepare and tell my hands that it was all their job tonight to do everything. And then after that show, and I really played a little different, like I would just not pick as hard mm -hmm. and just play the amp because it's just the amp. And my drummer came out to me, and it's funny because it's the drummer who never says, hey, great great guitar tone, never says, hey, you know, he came up to me and goes, man, the way you played tonight, I could park a truck between every note, it was so clear. And that really woke me up like, man, it's the less gain is better. And it's not like, it's not like um, finding a forgiving tone and just being sloppy. Because mm -hmm. it's never ever about that for me. It's always about always sounding clean. And if I can do it with less gain, the audience gets more of it. They get more notes. I can see that. They yeah. get more choice notes. They get more vibe as opposed to just blistering with all this gain. Yeah. And I noticed it too, a lot of my favorite guitar players back in the day had way less gain because they didn't have all that gain, <laughs> right? Right, and right. And allow a lot of those guitar players play with even more gain because they don't want to work as hard. I don't know, is that Yeah, it? yeah, you know I mean, I mean, it is easier to play with a lot more gain, that's true. It really is, and it, it's like people plug into, you know, my rig and they go, okay, where's, where's the gain? I'm like, that's it. Yeah. Is there more and more gain? <laughs> like, no, right. it's just this pedal here. No, and you're just, right about that. That's true. I, I think, well, like, and then, like, even the, like, the Morello thing, it's like those guitars are just double track and they're just big. Yeah. If they had more gain, they wouldn't be that big. Yeah. Right. And that's the thing, the same thing with the Daughtry record. Everybody thinks those guitars, the wall of guitars is enormous. But what makes it enormous is an old Marshall Plexi and a Gibson Jr. or a Les Paul with no, no overdrive, no nothing, mm. just making it clear and thick and that's why it sounds like that and as soon as you come in and turn more gain on and stuff like that everything gets really washy and the wall becomes not sometimes brittle but you can keep an eye on the brittleness but you don't hear the clarity of the chord like when i hear a, a chord i want to hear the separation in the strings yeah i don't want to be a wash yeah and i think that's what happened i think that's also what's happening when i hear a lot of direct stuff like a kemper uh -oh. or or a, a fractal and uh, it's just, to me, there's three telltale uh, characteristics that give away, that make, that scream fake to me. And one is squeal sound fake. Chugging sounds too EQ'd out. It's not speakers <clears throat> pouncing mm. on something, you know? There's no violence. Yeah. It's just woofy. And then the third one is uh, the chord. When you hit a chord, it just, all the notes mesh together. They don't stand out. Do you think you'll use any amp modeling just for convenience factor, or do you think you're still going to be like, no, nah, I need the tone to, I need it to be there, so it's always going to well, be there? Well, you know, when, when you do fly dates and you order a JCM 8, 800 stack somewhere, mm -hmm. like I just went to Indonesia, I just went to Romania over the summer, and there it is, and you plug in, and you're not always going to get a great amp. It's, oh, it's the only one we have. Mm. Oh. Or I went with Gilby, Clark was there, and Joel Hoxter was there, and we all wanted half stack Marshalls, and they're like, well, he gets a 2,000, and he gets a 900, and you get an 800, and I'm like, and that's, it worked out for everybody, everybody liked that. Oh, okay, okay. So, but I was lucky, 
Yeah. yeah. I, I really don't like the 900. I really hope I get an 800. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. And then, but you, you stand in front of it and it's still like, wow, it's, don't, it's not killing me. But you work with it. And that's another thing we were talking about when you get on stage and you plug in an unknown amp and you don't have your rig because you had to fly to yeah. you know, Detroit to do a gig. And it's not going to be what you're used to. And you need to adjust mm. and quickly, acclimate. Quickly, yeah, very exactly. quickly. And, you know, or your, your pedal board didn't make it with you if you're relying yeah. on your pedals. And then exactly. you've got, a, you're not, uh, you know. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, you, you asked for an amp, but it may not be what you get. Oh, in Romania, they didn't want to get us visas. So they said, hey, if you can not bring a guitar so you don't have trouble at customs, that would be awesome. What do you want? Oh. Well, shit, give me an SG and a, and a Les Paul. Yeah. And we'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, gotcha. So playing so not a, even a, your own guitar. Not even my own guitar. Wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, man. There was a lot, I mean, you have to be able to adjust to those situations. But what I really love uh, is pulling it off. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a self... There's, there's a sense of achievement. You, man, I played that shitty guitar into that shitty amp, and it was great. And even if you don't feel it was great and you have questions, you watch it on YouTube the next day and you go, hey, that wasn't bad. It was better than I thought. Mm. And I think that's what makes me uh, turn Phil X on. You know what I mean? I gotta be Phil X. There's a mission. Yeah, there's yeah, a mission. There's I gotta mission. be me. I gotta be able to do what I do in any, on any field. I like that. And any, on any field in which to frolic, yeah. I got to do what I do. And because you can name a bunch of guitars. If every, you can, how many guitars could you name that are world renowned, amazing guitar players? Plug into Angus Young's Marshall and play like they play. Probably not a lot. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that says a lot. Yeah. You know, you get comfortable, but getting outside of your comfort zone sometimes is a, is a lesson as well as a, a, I love the the challenge. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome, man. Well said. Well said. Thanks, and man. you know, the 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 career speaks for itself. I mean, you're in a, a huge band right now. A lot of tunes to learn. It was a lot of stuff that you had to 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 I mean, I can only imagine you you get to be you too in that band. I see. I see you get to do yeah. your thing in that band, and but yeah. you also got to play to the song, and you respect the well, music, and it's, you know. it's it's a whole wall of respect. It's a, a respect to the band, a respect to the songs, a respect to Richie Sambora, a yeah. respect to the fans. Right. Like, if uh, and it's funny because the first time I was like, I was like, let me don't screw up, man. Don't screw oh, up. Oh yeah, because yeah. When you think about it. <laughs> You could be a star all night, yeah. but you screw that up, yeah. and you suck. That that that, that was, dude sucked. That's the first thing I thought of too. I was like, dude, he has to he he has to he gets to play that. Yeah. And but you know what's amazing? I mean, "Living on a Prayer" was a song of my youth. Yeah. So I've played that song three hundred times. I still get goosebumps. Mm. It's that kind of thing. But if you can respect um, the band and the music and the legacy and the catalog, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Like you can't. You know, when even like uh, Born to Be My Baby, Baby is a, a, an amazing example because I would learn studio versions and live versions. And then if Richie goes off on another, you know, area in a solo, then maybe I'll go off a little bit too. But Born to Be My Baby, that solo on the record is amazing. Mm. Why would I play anything else? Yeah. You know, even though he goes off on another tangent, I'm sticking to this because it's so amazing. Right. Melodic, licky, beautiful, the note choice, everything is great. Yeah. So I, that's, I'm doing that. And then keep the faith. If I start it like it does on the record and then ease my way into me, it's, it's a, not only is it fun, but people yeah, really get a kick out of it. That's where I saw that. Yeah, keep the faith. Now I remember seeing that. that that's the, yeah, that's the clip. Yeah. Where I was like, oh. The flying V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that yeah. that's where I see, yeah. And it's those moments too. And uh, I mean, it all works together so well. And, uh, you know, you guys are all great musicians. I mean, you got Shanks up there with you as well, which is just fantastic. That's oh, kind of interesting too, to see like the producer in the band too. That's cool. Yeah, because he knows, because cool. he brings out his whole rig and he gets the sounds that he got on the record yeah. that he produced. So that's really interesting. Me, I just, people are like, how do you get that? You know, how do you get a Bon Jovi tone? And I'm like, it's just a really good rock tone. There you go. And you can get away with it. 
Yeah. And it was funny because um, John Douglas, JD, is, was Tico's tech last year. And he's also now the new drummer in Aerosmith. Because oh. he was teching for Joey, and then Joey had an issue, and then he had to play some shows. JD was Alex Van Halen's tech for 20 years. Whoa. So I would show up early at Bon Jovi Soundtrack before the band got there, and we would jam Van Halen. And, and, cool. then, and then Elders was in the building, and then we'd stop. Because, you know, you don't want anybody else's music on your stage when you're that guy. And yeah. I totally understand that. And I respect that. Yeah. With, but me and JD jamming Van Halen, it was like the same sound that I used for Bon Jovi all of a sudden sound like Van Halen. Because you get into that mode. Mm. And the reverse of that is when I went to Indonesia, I had to learn jump. So, and now all these isolated tracks on YouTube is a godsend. It's just yeah. unbelievable. You hear stuff you never heard before. It's amazing. I get goosebumps listening to that stuff. Yeah. But I listen to the, the, that isolated track of Jump, and it was like, you know what? Before the solo, that could be anybody on any tone. Because he's just going... Mm. I'm tuned down, I forgot. Right? Yeah. I should tune up. So he, uh, and I, it, I'm like, is this, is this a cover? And I, it's not, it wasn't a cover. It was Ed just playing three chords and just chugging like anybody else. It didn't sound special. Mm. And then the solo starts and then it's special as hell. Yes. But it's the same thing. When I play that tone and I play Bon Jovi songs, it sounds like Bon Jovi. When I play Van Halen, it sounds like Van Halen. Different guitar, different amp. I mean, it's the same, sorry, the same guitar, the same amp. So it really says a lot about hands and emotion that you're putting into it. And the mindset. Exactly, the yeah. mindset. Because it's a different mindset. Yeah, <laughs> and you're capturing, because that was one of my things too. Like I always wanted to like try to figure out, well, what would Jimmy Page play here? Yes. Or like what would Stevie Ray play in the vein of him, but like not copying. And you, you can, first learning it, yes. trying to get it as close as you can, and then taking, taking, doing the takeaways. Well, and again, let me do one more thing where I listen to somebody do something yeah. and then I, I thought, wow, that's really cool. Let me make sure. Hey, that's not bad. <laughs> not bad at all. It was pretty quick. So say Stevie Ray Vaughan gets kind of like, a, like I love the overbending and everything. And then he'd go. So I'm like, wow, he's taking the flat five pentatonic of B and inserting it into E. Yeah. Right? So you guys are So I'm like, uh, so what can I do with that, with, which, which is something that Phil X would do? Because I go. But if I go. So I'm, I'm going back and forth from the B with the flat five to the E with the flat five. And, and people are like, wow, how'd you think of that? Well, I got a little from Stevie Ray Vaughan. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, when you showed me the little example of what he plays where it does that, yeah. I didn't know what that was. Right. I just knew that, that I associated that lick with him. With him, yes. Exactly. I didn't know like what the technical terminology well, was. Well, I don't right? know if he knew. Right. To him, it just sounded cool. Yeah. Right? Did he know that he was, he's an A playing cold shot and that he does this little, does he know that he's going in right. e, e for a minute, yeah. for a second, with the flat five, and then back to A? I don't, I think he's just doing something that he thinks sounds good. Right, yeah. But me, my, my mind is like, okay, why does that make sense? And why is it so cool? And this is why. So I'm going to do it like this. And mm. I think, I think that's another thing about instincts for me. I hear something like that and I turn, I roll it into something that can be me. And that's, that's how people are like, how, how did you get that distinctive sound? And man, I'll, I'm not afraid to tell you where I got anything. But, and you know songwriters, some of the best songwriters, they say, hey, you know, good, good songwriters borrow and great songwriters steal. Well, it, stealing licks is the same thing, but I don't, I think it's disguising it is even yeah. more important than those other yeah. two things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I think you have to disguise it and make it yours. Like, if, if the funny thing is about Randy Rose just did this to the scale, he went, everybody else is going, and he just went, and 
all of a sudden, any any time I hear anybody do that, I go, "That's Randy Rhodes." Ah, <laughs> right? interesting. Yeah, like that uh, does. like uh. <laughs> That's totally. He doesn't do. That's what everybody else does, but he turned that mi major six into a minor six, and it became Randy Rhodes. Yeah, you're right. That totally. I can see that. Just that little thing there. Yeah. Wow, exactly. man. That's awesome. That's right. This is crazy. This has been. This has been fantastic. I'll be able to watch this video and slow it down so I can break down what you've been doing the whole time, <laughs> which is great. So you got. You're keeping busy. You guys got some stuff happening. I know yes. we can't talk about it too much, but there's some yeah. top secret activity happening. Yes. Awesome. And you're in Nashville for a little bit. Yeah, another uh, another uh, 10 days or something. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you guys are going to be doing some stuff. And then uh, what else is happening um, besides the Bon Jovi stuff? Is there anything else going on? Are you going to be doing some, some shows around town or anything uh, back home? Um, I'm working on... Um, I have a whole new drills record recorded. That's right. You were saying. Okay. okay. But it's... It's it just needs to be mixed. Okay. But our last, it's funny because our last uh, EP was called uh, "Stupid Good Lookings Volume One." Mm. So it was that was supposed to be a record. Just I don't I don't know. It was gonna be it wasn't gonna be volumes, but we had six songs done, and each song had a different drummer, and then all the other songs that got recorded each had a different drummer. Wow. So, because I, I love drums and I knew a lot of drummers. I did a lot of sessions with some of the key guys. Or, yeah. you know, Abel, uh, Abel Boyle Jr., we played on some records nice. together. Uh, he played on a, a couple of songs. And Liberty to Vita, we met during wow. the Hired Gun. And then I had a day off with Bon Jovi in 2018 with Tico Torres. And I go, hey, man, um, if I get a studio on Sunday, on the day, I know you like your days off, man. I know you want to go golfing. But if I get a studio, will you come and play drums on a drills tune? He goes, ah, I'll do anything for you. <laughs> he's like the coolest. He, okay, he's the coolest guy in the band. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. No, no question. Oh, that's but awesome. um, he's so cool. And so I got Tico Torres and Liberty DeVito, and I got Ray Luzier and Tommy Lee. Ray, nice, wow. And uh, the list goes on. There's so many players. Woo! It's just that's great. And it's it's funny because I just he like, and it was sad. We had uh, on uh, Stupid Good Looking Volume One. We had uh, Taylor Hawkins on the tune. Wow. So we were studying in L.A. and it was me and Dan and Taylor. And you feel like you're in a band together for about 90 minutes while you get the arrangement together. Yeah. Like I sent everybody a vocal and a guitar. And then they come in and give themselves. Okay. And the, the conversation turns from like, you know, me going, you know, uh, Taylor going, hey, let's do this before the last chorus. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. But at the end of the chorus, when we do that turnaround a couple of times, you got to go crazy. And he's like, great. Yeah. And then we lay it down three times, and, and we, I think we got it. We got it? Yeah, we got it. Wow. And then we had it, I get it, get it home, and I got Taylor Hawkins on, on a drum track, and I'm just, I send a rough to Dan, and he goes, I can't believe what a day that was. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. That is amazing, man. Yeah. So wow. I, I've been blessed. I mean, not only with the gigs and the records that I played on and, and this and that. And I mean, I got to record with Chris Cornell too. And that was like mind blowing because he wow. was an iconic vocalist and a, a hero. Yeah. And me playing guitar and his vocal coming out of the speakers was so surreal. And then we met and uh, talked a few times. And then when he passed, I was like, that was the one time in my life where I regretted not getting a selfie. Mm. Cause I don't want to be that guy. Hey man, yeah. can we get a pic man? Come here. I don't want to be that guy, but I regret not being that guy that one time. Because now yeah. it'll never happen again, right? Right, right. Yeah. Wow, man, that's crazy. What a wild ride, dude. Yeah. What a wild ride. I did see the Higher Gun movie. That was fantastic, by the way. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's very enlightening. When, when people tell me, hey, I want to get into sessioning. Can you tell me anything about it? I go, you need to watch that movie. You need to watch the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I can't say anything that you won't, that'll help you more I mean you have today movie. you definitely have said a lot of great things today <laughs> man um, but you know that's always it's one of the fantasies yeah it's one of the fantasies I'd be the big rock star or to be the session yeah. person the session player you know and to be able to do both it's like you win the game the, the ultimate you know that's the yeah. ultimate because it's like one or the other yeah and you know it especially if it's uh, and you, if you're doing good with your own music too that's awesome especially when you get to work with great people on your on your own music I mean dude that's all you really want to ask for you well know? it's funny because I mean I, you know I play with other people sometimes live too and I do flyaway gigs with 
almost anybody just yeah. to, you know, because I, I got to pay the bills. Yeah. And when people go, and I, I don't, I never say this, but I'll admit it on your show. Okay. People go, how come you don't do more drills? And it's simple, because the drills don't pay the bills. Gotcha, right. <laughs> that, no, time, that's my passion time. though, right? Yeah. That's my yeah. passion. I get to paint whatever I want on that canvas. And it's my, and I get Dan in there and he's, when, I, when it talk, comes to the drills and, and him being my bass player, he's like my, my left wing for life. Yeah. For sure. No matter who's on drums, if Dan's sure. there, it's amazing. Awesome. And, uh, and then we are going to put out this record and it's going to come out and we'll do, we'll do shows. We will. Sure. And um, when I'm not doing that, I'll be doing other stuff. I mean, I feel blessed that I get to just do this, play guitar. And this is my thing and I get to sing and I get to do what I want to do. And it's just fun, man. It is, man. And yeah. it's you're making it seem like it is, and it is. Yeah. So it's like that's the best part. That the, you know, that that's the one thing where I was telling everyone today when we're coming down to this, I was like, when he gets here, <laughs> have the cameras rolling as soon as he walks through the door. I was like, do not miss anything. And by the way, if it's just here, make sure it's both hands. Yeah. And he might stand up, he might sit down, he might go turn something. Like just get it all, because it's like it's it's I knew it was gonna be exciting and it was gonna there, be a there, little bit different. There was the me that wouldn't that wouldn't sit sit down. There was I was there, wondering if you yeah, were gonna sit there down. There was the me that would never sit down. Yeah. But I look at videos of me when when I was that guy and I look like I'm on cocaine. <laughs> Yeah, but that's natural. It was and all I've natural. I've never done it in my life. No, no, totally, totally. I know but, that for sure. Yeah. But it's it's like, wow, man, I'm amped. I'm cr I need something to calm me down so people will listen to me. Yeah, but you know, I mean, we're still listening. Yeah, it, but I mean, this is uh, yeah. this is still fun, and yeah. this we still got energy, and I get to play the way I want to play, and we talk about it, and I can. You know, if I can educate a handful of people Absolutely. and, and people, young yeah. players and stuff, I love that more than anything. Man, I think you're doing that, and I think it, it, we did it today, too. I think it was great, man. No, dude, thank you so much for, for joining us today and taking the time out of your... I know this is your one day off, and I'm just, you know, happy that you spent it with us, man. Thank Everybody, you, Mr. Phil X here, and uh, I think we'll do a little jam and take us home, right? Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, all right, let's go. That was great.